going from pastoring a church to full-time evangelism, was there a moment when you had to take a leap of faith, whether it was in finances or, or whatever, anything like that, or did just all the doors opened automatically? Well, the very first time I went evangelizing, when I went from working a job to evangelizing. That was a giant leap of faith. Of course, it was just me and my wife. We were quite young and poor. So the best time to start in ministry is when you're very poor. So you don't feel like you're losing anything. And I'm an advocate for getting started as young as possible, not to circumvent uh, training and mentoring, you know, especially if you're in college, getting an education is very important. Go through that process and do that. But as soon as you can, the better, because if you get on in life and have a family and a, and a security and a lot of responsibilities, it could be hard to bridge that gap. The second time I went evangelizing, you know, I had pastored 12 years. I'd worked at our international headquarters. By that time, I had traveled a lot with Brother Cole, and, and I knew a lot of people. And uh, so it was a little more natural. Uh, still a leap of faith. I mean, when you're um, living totally by the offerings and honorariums and goodwill of people, it's a leap of faith versus a steady income. But uh, having the influence and people knowing you and you know them, that made that a lot easier. Definitely. Uh, tell us about the moment when you first felt called in, to be a ministry. And then I'll just read it this way. Uh, describe the process by which you were called into the ministry. And then... I guess you've already touched on the transition into being an evangelist, but that first moment. Well, the call of God, you know, probably the single most important aspect of any minister's life, uh, the foundation of ministry is your calling. And the call of God is probably as unique and personal as every individual. Throughout my life at significant times, I can remember one time very young, I think it was about 10 or 11, uh, being in my room reading, and I came across the book of Jeremiah, uh, before I formed thee in the mother's womb, I ordained thee a prophet to the nations. And I just latched on to that and felt like God was using that verse of scripture to call me into ministry. And then through the years, you know, so many people, you know, back in those days we had testimony service and you'd stand up to testify and, you know, you have a little anointing come upon you. Yeah. And so the elders of the church that had been around a long time would come by and say the hand God's calling is on your life. They were able to recognize it. And that's one of the ways, you know, you're called people that are called and are seasoned can see it in you and in your life. And then of course there is that moment where you have to tell somebody, I feel like I'm being called to preach. And then of course you let somebody who's seasoned uh, lead you in that way. And I had that conversation with my pastor. I remember sitting right across the desk and telling him, I feel called. You know, it's kind of interesting. Some things you never think would play in, you realize them later in life, but as a very, very young boy, when I was very young, there's a now very famous photo of a little Ethiopian young child that's starving to death and a vulture is behind that child in the in the backdrop and I think it was on Time or Newsweek or something became a very iconic photo. I remember as a young child seeing that photo and I just cried and cried and cried and it just so moved me. Uh, Little could I know that years later I would be very influential and, and very active in an Ethiopian crusade that would see hundreds of thousands of Ethiopians uh, receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But now I can look back and that had to be connected. Yeah. There had to be a burden that I was sensing that was larger than that picture that I had no way of knowing being 10 years old, you know, or seven years old. I was real young in those days. Right. What would you say are the main reasons people don't receive the gift of the Holy Ghost? And when you identify those, uh, what are some techniques to kind of press through that? Well, uh, the first qualification on that question would be culture. Uh, where are you at? You know, if you're in Africa, uh, that question would be answered one way. Pakistan, uh, different places have different uh, reasons that would be hindrances. So culture uh, is a huge part of that answer. And then, and then religious culture, you know, what religious background they're coming from would also play into the ease by which people do receive the Holy Ghost or why there would be a, a mental block to receiving the Holy Ghost. In America, in the American church, what we have found, and I learned this from Brother Cole and then in my own experience doing a lot of crusades, in the American church, if you can convince the American people that they will receive the Holy Ghost, then they will come down and receive it. We, you know, I believe in the essentiality 
uh, the doctrine of essentiality, that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is an essential ingredient of the new birth. But in helping people receive the Holy Ghost in the American church and crusades, more important than preaching the essentiality is preaching the faith that if you come down here this altar today, you repent of your sins, God will fill you with the Holy Ghost. If they ever believe it'll happen, they'll come and get it. Believing they need it will not necessarily bring them to the altar. Sure. But if you can release faith in them to receive it, they will. One of the things that helps with that in the American culture is at the moment of the altar call. Now I'm all about enthusiastic church, uh, full on Pentecostal music, loud, fast, hand clapping, shouting, and I'm for fervent, um, very enthusiastic uh, exhortation and preaching. But at the moment of the altar call, especially if you're being seeker sensitive, people coming to the altar that are unchurched or unpentecostalized, remove the emotion, mm -hmm. just get very calm. You don't necessarily even have to have music. And just matter of factly, it's time to come to the altar. If you would like to receive the Holy Ghost, come down now and stand. And just a very calm approach and asking them to come directly works better than a fervent, uh, passionate appeal to the altar mm -hmm. to help people receive the Holy Ghost because they have to make that decision in their mind. And American people, if you push them too hard, they will feel pressured or manipulated and they'll push back. So if you just very calmly, matter of factly lay it out there, it's your choice, but here's what you need to do that can help them. If they, you know, once they start praying, there can be any myriad of things that would be in the way. Unrepentance, you know, if they've not repented, that's gonna block them. Uh, if they, um, if they are, uh, get stuck, they don't know how to pray out loud. You know, they're not accustomed to praying. So they're, they're awkward uh, letting their voice, you gotta warm them up through praise and worship to their not awkward praying out loud. Um, if they get stuck, you know, saying the same word over and over and over and over, you need to stop them and break them out of that uh, repetitive prayer. So there can be lots of things, you know, a whole altar working seminar, you know, answer all those questions. Sure, yeah, absolutely. One thing I say often to people when I'm praying for them is these words, the more you praise him, the more you will feel him. I think that's very important for a seeker, that the more you worship God, the more you will feel God. And then when they do start feeling the presence of the Lord, I think it's very valuable to acknowledge that's it, that you're feeling God, keep doing that. Um, I, I steward when to lay hands on people. Now if I'm the evangelist just walking through laying hands on everybody, but if I'm really trying to pray somebody through the Holy Ghost, I'll stand there and coach them and pray with them and talk with them until God really starts moving on them. And I wait for a moment of an unction and then lay my hands on them, hopefully to capitalize on the best moment and push them over the top. And when they start to speak in tongues, I'm an advocate of a, that you should acknowledge that. That's tongues, that's it, do that. You know, I know tongues when I hear it. I've been around a long time. I've heard a lot of people receive the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And when I recognize it, I tell them. And I know some people have an aversion to telling somebody, but uh, I have no problem yeah, telling them because I know. Know you know, it. I know it, I know it. You know, they need to know it for themselves, obviously. And at some point they have to have that. But I had a guy come to me one time and said, everybody was praying with me and, and they all said I got the Holy Ghost, but I didn't hear myself speak in tongues. I said, well, how do you feel? He said, oh, I feel great. You know, the last week, you know, it's been the most amazing week of my life. And they all said I spoke in tongues and I feel wonderful, but I didn't hear it. I said, well, I said, you need to hear yourself speak in tongues. That's an important part of your process. I said, but do you remember being born? He said, well, no. I said, but obviously you were. He said, well, yeah. I said, you know, things can happen to you that you don't necessarily remember, but you slowly gain an awareness. You wake up to them. Yeah. And that can happen with people. It's such a, uh, an amazing experience that they may not be able to remember they spoke in tongues. It doesn't mean it didn't happen. And it doesn't mean they, don't, they need to have that experience where they do hear themselves. They need that assurance. But I think that it's okay to say, I heard you. You're good. So he walked out there on the porch, lifted up his hands, and he said, In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command this rain to stop now. And it just blew. I mean, it's just like a, it's almost like it made it worse. <laughs>